Hi everyone and welcome to today. To I hope you can hear my audio. If you are experiencing any technical issues at all, you can go ahead and reach out to me using the at symbol Samantha in the chat window. Since it's 1 p.m. here in Michigan, let's go ahead and get started. This webinar, webinar is brought to you by Evaluate, the evaluation hub for the Advanced Technological Education Program. Evaluate advanced education in the AT community by offering trainings, cultivating a network, researching emerging topics, and collecting data about the ATE program. Be sure to check out the Evaluate website to learn more. The slides from this webinar are already on Evaluate's website along with several other resources. You may also download these resources by following the link on the right side of your screen. The recording will be available within a couple of days and that will also be emailed to you. As I said, I'm Samantha Hooker. I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Our presenters today include Lissa wilson Becho, the Principal Investigator of Evaluate, which is located at the Evaluation Center at Western Michigan University. Sandra LeRae, Lead Consultant for SPEAR, the STEM Program Evaluation, Assessment and Research, and the new Director of the Center for Academic Research and Excellence at Chattanooga State. And Lana Rux, Founder and Principal Consultant of the Rux Group LLC, a leading minority woman-owned research and evaluation firm. We'd like to recognize our Evaluate team who have worked behind the scenes to help bring this webinar to you today, Lori Wingate and Kelly Robertson. And as always, we thank Carolyn williams Norin, our copy editor. This webinar is design, designed for individuals funded by the NSF, NSF's Advanced Technological Education Program, or ATE for short. The ATE program is focused on improving technician education, mainly through two-year colleges. It funds projects in high-tech areas like advanced manufacturing, engineering technologies, information technologies, and more. This is also a good time to point out that the views expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. And now I'll turn things over to Lissa. Thanks, Samantha. So hello, everyone. My name is Lissa, and I'm excited to be here with you all today. So as a reminder, you do have a chat box to the right side of your screen. So go ahead and introduce yourself and say hello. Uh, it looks like we have about 130 people on with us so far today. So I'm actually going to go ahead and minimize the cameras of the speakers just so you can focus on the content of our slides, but then we're gonna turn the cameras back on when it comes to the question and answer session. All right, so let's go ahead and jump right into today's content. So you probably have a lot of research tools in your toolbox, things like survey methods, interviewing techniques, or statistical analysis, but program evaluation has some unique demands that might require additional tools. So my co-presenters and I want to give you an insight into those tools today. We only have an hour, so we don't have time to dive deep into each one of these methods, strategies, or approaches that we're gonna share with you, but we hope that you walk away energized and inspired to think about evaluation differently as something more than just applying the same set of research tools that you have in your toolbox. So here's a quick overview of our agenda for today. So I'm gonna start off by talking about how the demands of evaluation differ from those of research. Then I wanna share some practical evaluation tools that you can add to your evaluation toolbox. We'll then hear from Lana Rux about rubrics as an approach to evaluation and an example of the partnership rubric that she developed to evaluate collaborations with business and industry. Then we're going to hear from Sandra LeRae about ripple effect mapping in identifying and prioritizing outcomes. So throughout today's webinar, we have multiple question breaks. So please feel free to put your question in the chat box at the right hand of the screen at any time throughout the webinar. We will make sure to keep track of them and then bring them up and ask them during breaks. So really, we want to hear from you. So please put your questions in there. All right, so let's start by looking at evaluation in comparison to research. 
So both are systematic ways of learning. In fact, they have a lot in common. Research and evaluation share data collection methods, analysis techniques, even scientific theories and lenses. So these are likely the tools that you already carry around in your toolbox. So what really makes them different? Well, some boil these differences down into sayings like things like research asks what so, while evaluation asks so what? Or the purpose of research is to prove, while the purpose of evaluation is to improve. Or another one that I've heard is that research is intended to generalize, whereas evaluations are more context dependent. So these sayings, I think that they can help you grasp some of the big picture differences in evaluation and research. But I also find that sometimes these black and white sayings, they kind of oversimplify. So instead, I find it helpful to look at how these two really differ in practice. So in practice, evaluators, they face some really unique demands. So first of these demands is the engagement of decision makers, participants, funders, and other voices throughout the evaluation. So while research often centers the researcher in decisions about things like research questions, methods, or analysis, evaluators often find that their evaluation questions are set by the project or by the funder, and that the engagement of participants in the evaluation planning and design can lead to a more accurate and useful finding. Second, it's fairly accepted that evaluation involves valuing. So this is when the project outcomes are compared to a standard or benchmark to determine whether or not that project is working. So this might also be called evaluative sense-making or even goal achievement, but I'm gonna call it valuing in today's webinar to really connect our conversation back with the evaluation literature. But know that this process can take a variety of shapes in practice. Third is an intentional emphasis on use. So evaluation findings are intended to be used. While research often strives for a deeper understanding of something, evaluation is really intended to have practical use to improve a project or to make decisions. And finally, evaluators constantly have to balance considerations of feasibility. Time, money, or data might be limited, but evaluators are still expected to answer the evaluation questions to the best of their abilities. So evaluators may be asked to make trade-offs between things like accuracy and timeliness or utility and rigor. So here we have some demands on evaluation that don't always show up in a research study. And to meet these unique demands on evaluation, you're gonna need some unique tools in your toolbox. But before we take a look at some of those tools, I wanna pause here to see how you have experienced the difference between evaluation and research. So using the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen, share some of the demands you've experienced in evaluation that might not have shown up in a typical research project, or share a situation that you have experienced in a project evaluation that you think would have differed if the project was research instead. So just to repeat that question as we wait, you know, what, what are some of the things that you have experienced in evaluation that you think makes it really different from a research project? So Lori says that when I work with researchers, I find they tend to want to get into the weeds, which can drain resources from answering critical questions. Elizabeth points out that the grant reporting requirements can be quite different in evaluation than research, yeah. Um, now, now the answers are flowing in. Uh, so uh, Deborah says that clients hesitate to respond to some research questions for sure. And, and Jeff points out that evaluation tends to proceed within a framework that is intended to produce specific findings related to the project goals, whereas research sometimes can be more open-ended like exploratory. Yeah. Uh, I, Becca states that stakeholders have a vested in, interest in one finding or another. So yeah, I think there are a lot of political and ethical concerns, certainly when it comes to evaluation that might sh not show up in research. Um, and April points out that sometimes evaluations just have smaller sample sizes. I think that's a really um, great observation because I think it, it influenced, I, Karen said the same thing. Sorry, Karen, I missed that. 
These are really great. So thank you so much for all of these comments. Um, I think this will really like bring in to the rest of our webinar as we talk about some evaluation specific tools. So let's dive into some of these tools. And again, these tools are really aimed at dealing with some of the unique situations that you have all mentioned in the chat window. So I am going to share a lot of different evaluation techniques right now, um, 16 of them, in fact. So as a reminder, we're not going to have time to go into depth on every single one. And honestly, not every evaluator is expected to have all of these tools in the toolbox. But what we're hoping to do today is to expand your imagination on what is possible. So get you familiar with things that you might not have heard of or some new strategies that might fit, fit well with your project evaluation. I also wanna say upfront that uh, we've collected all of these evaluation tools in a handout that you can download in the handouts tab on the right side of your screen. So this handout has a description of each of the tools that I'm gonna mention and then resource links to open access resources where you can learn more about them. All right, so to organize these evaluation tools, we're gonna look at them in four categories of the unique demands on evaluation. So tools that address engagement, valuing, feasibility, and the use of findings. So let's look at some of the evaluation specific tools that provide guidance on engaging groups of people. So these are some examples. They're certainly not an exhaustive list of all of them. But some tools are culturally responsive evaluation, collaborative approaches to evaluation, stakeholder analysis, and photo voice. So I want to dive a little bit deeper into one of these and to look at it more closely. So let's look at culturally responsive evaluation. So culturally responsive evaluation recognizes that demographic, sociopolitical, and contextual dimensions of culture really matter fundamentally in evaluation. The culturally responsive evaluation framework, which you can see on your screen right now, it outlines how culture influences all aspects of the evaluation process, from planning to data collection to reporting. So the multitude of theoretical and practical writing on culturally responsive evaluation, it really rejects culture-free evaluation and gives evaluators strategies to design and carry out their practice in a way that is responsive to the values and beliefs of their stakeholders. So there are a number of tools specific to evaluation in the area of valuing. So these include things like rubrics, goal attainment scaling, social return on investment, and cost benefit analysis. So let's take a closer look at goal attainment scaling as an example of this set. So the goal attainment scale is a tool to compare outcome data across different goals or contexts. An evaluation steering committee is involved in the operationalization of the varying levels of expected outcomes. Findings are then rated into levels uh, of, are they less than expected, expected or more than ex of the expected outcome. The, this goal attainment scale allows for the comparison of various outcome goals. So evaluation tools that address feasibility concerns include things like causal link monitoring, most significant change, success case method, contribution analysis, outcomes harvesting, and ripple effect mapping. So taking a closer look at most significant change as an example of this set, most significant change is a qualitative approach to understanding personal accounts of project impact, and then deciding which of these is most significant, hence its name. So first, participants are asked to share their stories of significant change as a result of engaging in the project. Once these stories are collected, a group of stakeholders sorts the impacts into groups of more or less significant in alignment with the project goals and intended outcomes. So finally, we have a set of evaluation tools that encourage use of evaluation findings. So these are things like data parties, rapid appraisal, utilization focused evaluation and logic models. So let's take a closer look at data parties. 
So data parties are events that bring people together to collectively analyze and interpret data that have been collected. They provide interpretations on what the data mean and implications for action. So data parties can be a fun, interactive way for decision makers to immerse themselves in the data in a way that they wouldn't otherwise if they were, say, reading a more traditional report. Data parties encourage use, but they also engage stakeholders in the sense making of that data. So here's an overview of all of these evaluation tools. Um, and again, these are only a collection of the tools that might fit in each category. But I'm going to pause here for a chat question. So which of these tools do you think might align with your project evaluation? Or which of these are you most interested in learning more about? So you can use the chat window to the right side of your screen to share which of these evaluation tools you're most interested in learning more about. So we have data parties, most significant change, culturally responsive evaluation, ripple effect mapping, you're in luck, ripple effect mapping, we're gonna talk more about. A lot of culturally responsive evaluation or CRE as it's also known, outcomes harvesting, yeah, most significant change or success case method. Data parties, yeah, data parties are so fun. I think there are so many different ways you can approach it but that idea of bringing everyone together and really getting into the data. Wonderful. Well, I know that this was a pretty quick overview of all of these, but we are gonna take a deeper dive into two of these approaches today, rubrics and ripple effect mapping. So I am honored to be joined by Lana Rux and Sandra Larray to talk more about these approaches. So they're gonna share stories about their experience with these tools in applying to various examples in ATE projects and other STEM education evaluations. So first, I'm gonna hand it over to Lana. Thank you, Lissa, and hello, everyone. It's such a thrill to be with you today. During our time together, there are two things that I want to do. First, I want to briefly talk about the benefits of using rubrics in evaluation. Then I want to spend a bit more time actually walking through an actual example. So let's start first with the benefits. One benefit of rubrics is really related to the idea of being able to outline their criteria and different levels of performance. While admittedly that is actually related to or at the heart of the definition of a rubric, it's also a benefit as well. Relatedly, another benefit is that rubrics allow you to operationalize otherwise difficult to measure variables. And this is really important because there's a real tendency at times to ignore the key variables because if they're hard to measure, um, and instead measuring what's a little bit easier to measure instead, and a rubric will allow you to make sure that you're not ignoring these otherwise key variables. And then finally, another really important component as well is that in using a rubric, it really helps to catalyze internal consensus of expectations. And that's really important because it lays the groundwork among the project team for implementation. So the specific rubric that I wanna to talk to you about is the partnership rubric. And in talking about this partnership rubric, let me provide some contextual information for you. So first, if you've been around the NSF ATE community for much time at all, you know that partnerships are a critical component for projects to achieve outcomes or as an outcome in and of itself. And so over time and working with projects within this community, I became really interested in trying to figure out how to better systematically measure partnerships. So look to the literature to try to find some standardized tools. In completing that search, really what I found was that there was a real dearth of tools that measured industry and educational partnerships in a way that are reflected within the ATE community. What I found instead was primarily tools that were measuring the commercialization process. And so 
In conjunction with my colleague, Mike Fitzgerald, we really aim to develop a tool to help track and assess partnership involvement over time. The actual development of the partnership rubric really evolved over a couple of different iterations. So the first iteration was really this initial articulation, which resulted in a rubric that looked like this. So let me orient you to this particular rubric. On the left-hand side, we had listed all the potential partners that would be involved in working within a project or that a project team would be interested in working with. At the top, we had various areas in which the partners could be engaged with the projects on. And I should say in terms of really identifying these in terms of the nature of involvement, they were really based on our experiences, um, and also some expectations that were outlined by other grant funding uh, programs. Then also at this stage of the development of the rubric, we really were trying to identify if involvement was dichotomous, if they were involved, yes, or if they weren't involved, no. And we used all that information to really create a partnership involvement score. And I should say that the incorporation of this type of rubric was very important and really helpful for the project teams that we were working with. And I should also say that we still were using and collecting qualitative data and using the, the stories of involvement. But this addition of being able to systematically understand the involvement of partners across multiple different areas really created a rich data set to really understand how partnership involvement was evolving over time. And because this was so helpful for the project team, we really became interested in being able to disseminate this tool out. Um, and towards that end, it really led to the second phase of development. And in the second phase of development, we were really interested in validating the tool focused primarily on face validity. And so towards that end, we were really privileged to be able to partner with Mary Solinsky and Rachel Bauer of the Working Partners Targeted Research Grant that later involved into the Working Partners Project and Workshop. And through that combined effort, we held a host of feedback sessions with project team members and evaluators that provided really important information in terms of how to best use the rubric. And we captured that information and really incorporated it to the partnership rubric to update and to revise that rubric. So this is the resulting rubric at this point. Again, let me reorient you to um, the various elements. So very similar to the original version, we have the partners that are listed on the left-hand side. And at the top, again, in a similar vein, we had different areas of involvement. However, we use a slightly different language. We refer to this as partnership models. And also, I should say, we were really able to leverage the thorough research that was conducted through the target, the Working Partners Targeted Research Grant to really understand the different types of partnership models that were in existence and created alignment uh, in the language to what was actually in the literature. And I should also note there was kind of interesting finding is that while the, the language of the models really evolved from what we used originally, a lot of the content of those models really, uh, excuse me, the content of those areas really did overlap. Another piece that we incorporated in as well was added in a bit more variation of involvement. So in just say, instead of just saying there was yes, there was involvement, no involvement, we looked at was involvement far below an agreed upon level? Was it at the agreed upon level or was it beyond that agreed upon level. And then another element that emerged through various conversations was that we also had to take into consideration that some areas you wouldn't have any expectation of involvement. And so there is also this category for not applicable. So similar to the first 
version, there's a global score that one could be that could be calculated. But then also, we also emphasize that there could be a partnership score. So you could look at scores by each partner that was involved. And then also that there was an actual model score as well. So let's see what this looks like in terms of practice. Let's say you have an auto technician project in which you're trying to increase the number of technicians that are involved in being able to repair electric vehicles. So you may end up with a rubric that looks like this, where you have the partners again on the left hand side. And with once all the information is incorporated within the partnership rubric, then you can actually calculate out a global score. You can calculate out again a score by model. And then you can calculate a score by partner involvement. And what's nice about having each of those scores is that then you can actually graph those by year. And let's kind of focus in on the partner scores to see what that looks like. So in year one, you could have partner scores that looks like this. And then you can start to see how it changes across year two and year three. And again, you can use any of those scores to be able to chart out and graph and really be able to monitor change across multiple years. So if you're interested in more information, you can visit our website for, to look at for tools, or you can also visit the Working Partners Project and Workshop website where they have a host of information on partnerships and what types of workshops that they're offering as well. So I'll pause there and turn things back over to Samantha. Thank you, Lana. We do have a couple of questions coming through, so I will go ahead and um, ask those now. Okay, um, Lana, for you, uh, in the example you gave during your presentation, Gina is wondering who is rating the level of involvement? Yeah, that's a really good question. And generally speaking, that the levels of involvement a lot of times are originally coming from the project team. Um, but what we've learned over time in terms of working through the validation process, it's also helpful to have that conversation with the partner as well. So as the part project team may have an initial expectation in what the partner can provide, what they're interested in, in terms of um, their participation. But then very often the project team is also having that conversation with the, um, with the actual pro uh, partner entity as well. And I think that that goes back to the additional benefit of having a rubric is it really helps to set what expectations are. And so it really helps in terms of making sure that everyone's on the same page, but that's a really good question. Thank you. Okay, and then Lissa, um, we have a question about the tools you covered in the beginning. So can those tools be combined? And then more specifically, April asks, can CRE be combined with most significant change? Yeah, thanks, Samantha. I'm glad you, you pulled those questions together because they are both such great questions. You know, in the creation of this webinar, in the end, we went with the, the terminology of practical evaluation tools with the recognition that all of those tools are different. They're not all the same, right? Some are um, method approaches, some are data collection approaches, some are evaluation approaches, um, and some I would even call lenses, right? So uh, some call culturally responsive evaluation and evaluation approach. But I personally like to think of it a little bit more as a lens because I think that you can very easily combine it with something like most significant change or to be honest, any evaluation approach because it is just like a set of glasses that you can put on that asks you to be really critically reflective in how you're engaging with people throughout your evaluation, what types of questions you're asking, how you're wording items on a data collection instrument, 
Um, so I think that that circle, that that culturally responsive evaluation framework that we saw earlier, there are, are more literature out there that that uh, talks about like what, what should you be asking yourself at each step and how does that culture come into play at each step to make that evaluation um, more valid, right, but also more useful and more meaningful um, to everyone involved. Okay, thank you. And Lana, we have another for you. Erin um, is curious if you could explain why and how the score are calculated as percentages. What does 100% mean? fully meets expectations of involvement, and how is that percentage calculated? Yeah, those are really good questions. And we have a, some we have some additional tools too that can really kind of walk through those elements. Let me first talk about um, the how to calculate out the percentages. So the kind of simplest way is when you outline what type of involvement that you would expect. So this is all about what you're expecting in terms of expectations and if they're living up to those expectations. So when you actually outline what those expectations are, that really sets the level, the, the highest level potential score at a two. That's just how we kind of rated it from zero, one, and two. And so when you go across each of the partners and you identify um, it, what areas that you think they would be able to be involved in, and then you set out what they would be able to perform in terms of their expectations, you would then take all of that and multiply the number of partners, or excuse me, the areas that they would be able to be involved in, and you would multiply that against two. And that really gives you a denominator. So if you have one partner in terms of what you wanted from that, that partner is to be able to provide um, experiential learning opportunities and they provided the experiential learning opportunities, then that would be a two. Uh, and that's how you would get to 100% because they lived up to their expectations. Uh, and so again, What's really key is in terms of how you're defining out what those expectations are, being able to have conversations with that project, project team so, so that there's clarity in terms of um, what they can do or what they're not going to be able to do in support of the project. But a lot of that, again, is really project dependent and then also partnership dependent. So hopefully that kind of quick um, overview. Like I said, we have some resources that actually walk you through the map and how to calculate it. But hopefully that helps in terms of understanding what 100% is versus 50% and how that's actually calculated. Okay, and uh, Lisa, what do you see as the difference between culturally responsive evaluation and equitable evaluation? A great question. So both are actually seen as separate approaches to evaluation that each have their own kind of steps and processes to them. Um, so they both have their own framework. So we showed that culturally responsive cycle framework, but equitable evaluation also has their own framework. And specifically, they have a set of principles. And so I think while culturally responsive evaluation um, demands that evaluators consider culture at every aspect. Equitable evaluation, one of their principles is not only that they are considering equity and how they're acting, but also to say that equity is the center, is the driver of all things in the evaluation. Everything from um, relationships to what is measured and how evaluation questions are structured. So one of their principles is that evaluation work should um, answer critical questions about the ways in which historical and structural decisions have contributed to the conditions to be addressed and the effect of a strategy on different populations and the underlying systemic drivers of inequity. So even though I think that the, the two approaches, uh, again, they can be combined. In fact, I, I think that 
they probably would be inevitably, like you probably are taking a culturally responsive approach if you are taking an equitable evaluation approach as well. Um, but they do have uh, slight differences for sure. Okay, thank you. And we have one last question uh, for Lana and then we'll uh, turn it over to Sandra. Um, Lana, has or could any bias come from your rubric or rubrics in general? I mean, yes. I mean, because if you are thinking about the placement within the grid that Lissa was sharing of valuing, what you find important, what you think that you want to emphasize, will, if it's part of what you're valuing or what you need, there would be bias. I think that the key part to that is in terms of how you are actually defining it in terms of bias. I mean, it's going to reflect your values and then the most uh, kind of simplest definition of bias, then it would be bias. But I think the only piece of caution is the weight of the word when we use the word bias, that it's negative. Uh, but if it's re really reflecting what you're valuing and what is needed and what is uh, important to you, then it will have a tilt to it whether it's bias in terms of the negativity that we associate with that, that's a whole different question. But that's my um, kind of quick response to that. But that seems like a, a, a very good question and kind of a lengthy conversation as well. Thank you, Lana. Okay, I will turn it over to Sandra. Thank you. I, thank you for the opportunity to be here today to talk about one of my favorite topics in evaluation, ripple effect mapping. So ripple effect mapping is typically thought of as a qualitative evaluation tool for measuring mapping and impacts. But I often layer it with some quantitative measures like surveys, for example. So with the um, different program examples that I have planned to show you today, I'll talk about how I layer in some of those things and maybe some of those different tools that uh, Lissa mentioned earlier. So this is my favorite ripple effect map, and it's not one that I have done. It's from um, the uh, Mississippi State University Extension. And when you think of when I think of ripple effect mapping, I think of it like throwing a, a stone in a pond and measuring what ripples out. So right in the center of a ripple effect map is typically the program name. So in this case, it's tied. So, and as the ripples grow out, those are, begin with things that were intended in the program design and then ripple out, out to some other impacts. Um, and this is a great time to think about culturally responsive evaluation. So things intended as impacts and the return on investment maybe more broadly. So in this ripple effect map, you'll see that there are some capital letters that I'm putting boxes around now. And here's where the evaluators have made categorical names for the different effects or different impacts within the program. And then you'll also notice that there are some print written at a diagonal and those are some of the impacts that are measurable or things to explore that are being measured or things to explore further. So I have a few examples of my own. This one is a biotech program, an ATE biotech program. And here we used a ripple effect map to measure the broader impacts and the unintended outcomes of this program. So I'm gonna walk you through the steps. So in the center of the program is the, the name we, biotech, and I'm covering that up with the circle and then showing you the first ring out. So when the program was designed, the proposal was submitted to NSF, we knew that they were, that our immediate impacts or our immediate people group was were our scholars and engaging them in an opportunity for a certification in biotech, but also the opportunity for an AAS in biotech. We knew that there were some internship opportunities we wanted to offer. And we also knew, like Lana was talking about, that industry partners are a key piece in NSF ATE proposals. So we knew we had a, a 
uh, we were rippling out to our industry partners and they were going to be involved in certain ways. Some of them were intended parts of our proposal, like an opportunity with Department of Energy and knowing that this this school was located in the biotech quarter, but then there ended up being um, some environmental science industry partners that we were able to pull in that we hadn't anticipated, and then the opportunity for additional internships and even study abroad that rippled out of this program as it was implemented. And then we have a, a larger ring where we had intended in, in the uh, later years of the program to infuse some summer professional development for high school teachers and to involve high school students, but it rippled out into some um, engagement with maker spaces in area schools and an OER repository that were some additional impacts that we were able to measure. And then in our outer ring, we included some of the engagement we were able to get from high school student families and how we increased some opportunities for them to engage, to learn more about this community college. And then again, rippling in the effects of some broader impacts and ways in which we might pursue additional funding, like going up to the ATE center level. So that's one example. And here is another, a, a different way to maybe look at ripple effect mapping. So this is a ripple effect map to evaluate the alignment of programs, educational courses to workforce development. So this is an example of an industrial systems engineering program and specifically looking at things at the course level. And we layered this with a survey to recent graduates of the program over the last five years, and then also to our industry partners that were a part of the a part of our program design, but also industry members that students told us were places that they were working. And so here, when we first started mapping, we were looking at courses themselves and rippling out to concepts that were part of the courses and then metric measures. And you'll see that nodes, we call them, were added as we went along. So I'll show you how this one kind of came about. So it's an industrial systems engineering program and embedded in that were certain basic analytical tools that we wanted students to be able to understand as they went through the program to be successful with a strong skill base. They're, it's industrial systems, so they're looking at system design and processes in industry. And then we're layering in as we're doing these mapping the data we received back from recent graduates, students, and industry partners. And they told us that, that communication and human relationship skills were things that they found they needed to engage with immediately as they started working in these companies. And then, oops, sorry, I went a little too fast. Um, then there were real world problem solving skills that occurred in the workforce that they wanted to know more about. And our industry partners survey data aligned with our mapping and responses from graduates at the same time. And just to give you an idea of where I am, I'm located in East Tennessee. So some of our industry partners are Nissan and Volkswagen and Amazon is coming to the series. So we are looking at systems in those organizations. And this is an example of what some of our industry partners are saying to us. They're saying, well, our students coming to us from industrial systems need to be able need to be ready to solve problems and people who can be a, who can work together talk to each other and they're saying that these are as important or more important than other skills so having this data our ripple effect maps of the courses combined with how we showed in a ripple effect map layering in our survey design helped us go, to go back to the courses in the program and make sure that we were layering in communication and human relationship skills to our curriculum. Like, for example, some project-based learning um, techniques to encourage that communication and collaboration and real-world problem-solving skills. It made us look differently at internships and when they should be available in the program and how we can um, infuse that throughout the program. 
So that was one, that's a way ripple effect helped in design. And then here's one last example of ripple effect mapping for making iterative changes to programs. And this was done in a virtual setting. And it was a, it's a program that um, we were looking at later on in the, in the design. So we'd had a year under our belt. We wanted to be able to look at the ways in which our recruitment, I'm gonna put boxes around it, recruit, oh, sorry, recruitment transition and retention were being supported in the program. So in our proposal design, we had goals that were spoke to those specific areas. And then we wanted to see how they were um, rippling out and using this Jamboard with post-it notes, grouping and categorizing our goals and the way in which we were measuring them. So you'll see that on the orange post-it notes. How are we um, assessing the actions that we're taking in terms of recruitment, transition, and retention? And I have a slide with a couple of my favorite resources. So the very first ripple effect map that I shared, the program Tide, is in a book that's a free download, a field guide to ripple effects mapping. And that Tide example is in there and many other ones. It has great information for how to infuse that. It also talks a lot about culturally responsive evaluation. So it, it would be an excellent example to take a look at. And then the book on the right, the Practical Mapping for Applied Research and Program Evaluation, that book is from SAGE, and it's one that I often refer to when I think about mapping curriculum um, and certifications in AT programs. So I wonder if there's any, I guess I'm to pass it back to you, Lissa, for questions. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Sandra. So we hope that today's examples have given you some ideas of evaluation tools that you might want to add to your toolbox. So I'm going to hand it over to Samantha for our final question break. So make sure to add all of your questions into the chat box. Okay, thank you, Lissa. Uh, Sandra, first question is for you. Um, okay, sorry, one second here. Okay. Um, Amy is not sure how or by who this diagram is put together. Are you asking participants? Are multiple people writing things down? Is this only at the end of the project? In this example with VW, et cetera, um, she's not sure how the ripples contain one another or how they're different from a list of competencies and is looking for a little more basics. Okay, great. Okay. Well, first, let me start with when when you might do a ripple effect map. So I often start and you'll notice some of the examples have maybe some different colored marker colors. So I sometimes a ripple effect map works really well in the program design. So oftentimes I begin with the people that are going to be the primary investigators and we say, okay, here's what we want to do. We have this program who will be our immediate people groups? Or sometimes people say stakeholder groups. Who are our immediate people groups? What are our immediate program elements? And this also helps design a logic model sometimes. What activities are we going to do in this program? And typically it starts with the, if we're talking ATE, we're thinking about our first ripple being our students and the program. And the next ripple being our industry partners. There are other times, though, when a ripple effect map works really well with community partners. So in a lot of community based participation evaluation, I've used ripple effect maps in an industry partner meeting and in a meeting with community to measure the valuing that Lissa was talking about and use of, of programs. So at any time, I guess is the short answer to that question. And then I'm looking at in the example with Volkswagen. Okay, so in the industry partner example, I was showing a layering of our ripple effect maps, which were the program one that looked kind of spidery to the survey results. So we used a ripple effect map there as a mixed methods approach, beginning with the courses themselves. So program mapping and 
with um, results from the survey of recent graduates. And that one, I see your question there. That one is a list of learning competencies, that particular example. Yeah, that's curriculum de program design. Okay, thank you. And Sandra, you covered this kind of, if there's anything else you want to add, I know a lot of it was just covered, um, but Sarah's wondering, oh, I'm sorry, I just put up the wrong question here. I feel like that has nothing to do with what right. I was talking about. Okay, uh, Gina is asking. Oh, I, I love the question about reporting. <laughs> yeah, I love the reporting. That is great. So I that's one of my favorite parts about ripple effect mapping is when you get those unintended outcomes. And so the way that I report that in my evaluation reporting is, um, is to talk about how, and lots of times I'll put a picture of the ripple effect map whether whether it happens to be a zoom whiteboard or Jamboard or physically on paper and then speak to those iterative changes in my evaluation report so we discovered that there was an environmental science company that was interested in our biotech graduates i tell them about the company and i tell them how students are going to be involved and i talk about how we've made adjustments to some of our metrics to capture that new industry partner, for example. Okay, and have you ever done REM both prospectively, unexpected outcomes, and retrospectively, actual outcomes, then compare the results? If not, what do you think about the idea? I love the idea. That's a great idea. So I've, I've, gone taken oftentimes I take because I think I have a logical mathematical mind lots of times I take what's the ripple effect map which is usually done collaboratively with people in the program and people in the community and I pop it back into my logic model or my theory of change model and it and then I'm adding pieces that were um, planned outcomes and then any changes along with it Oh yeah, someone asked about focus group. Yes, that's, yeah. That's my favorite way to do it is with a group of people. Okay, and based on your work using REM, what have been some limitations you've identified in the process? I One limitation I think is something you can notice in focus groups, right? Someone running with it, right? So who's holding the markers and who has a turn? So I've had to guide that process like you would guide a focus group and um, ask for particular folks to add. Another thing that I've really loved about doing ripple effect mapping in a virtual space is giving extra process time. Because when we do it in person and we have markers and we're all together, then we leave the meeting room. But using, um, I've used Padlet, I've used uh, Jamboard, ways that are in a, a virtual space or Zoom or Microsoft Whiteboard, it gives people the chance to revisit and keep going in and adding additional pieces without the pressure of being necessarily in a group and having a very boisterous person, you know, taking a, running with it, let's just say. Okay, and how do you incorporate quantitative data? Ooh, okay. So typically I, I look to how I'm gathering information either through document analysis um, and through survey design. So if I think about an ATE program, there's some institutional data, right? Recruitment, retention, um, and then there's there may be survey data. So I'm gathering information about students' experience I'm gathering information from industry partners um, and that can be surveys. It can be, like I said, document analysis. I typically use interviews and focus groups. And I love Lana's rubric. That is for sure going to become a part of my um, evaluation process with ATE. I love that. So yeah, I, I'm always taking a mixed methods approach. I find the ripple effect mapping as a way for people to see the program whole, whole and to see where their program is touching 
other people groups that they may not have anticipated. Okay, thank you. Uh, that was the last of our questions. So um, I do have a couple of perfect. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Lisa. Oh, go okay. Ahead. I was just going to say I have a couple of announcements to finish up um, our webinar today. Thank you all for participating and attending. Um, as I said, I've got two announcements and then we can wrap up. Oh, it would help if I change the slide, right? Okay, so first, um, help us celebrate excellence in ATE evaluation by nominating an ATE project evaluation for the Outstanding ATE Evaluation Award. This year's deadline for submissions is November 21st. More information can be found at the website you'll see at the bottom there, evalue-8.org slash OEA. So we encourage everybody to check the site out and uh, nominate. Okay, lastly, if you can please take a minute to respond to our feedback survey. We actively use these post-webinar responses to continue to improve our activities. You can access the survey using the link on the left side of your screen, and we'll also put that link in the chat. So this will close our webinar for today, and thank you again for attending. Thank you all.